Hello, and welcome to Talk Grasslands, the new series of online talks by the Eurasian Dry Grassland Group. My name is Dida Mambarla, and I'm a postdoc in the Technical University of Munich. And together with Alla Alexanian and Stefan Van, we are organizing EDGG conferences and talks. For those who do not know EDGG, it is one of the largest groups of grassland researchers and conservation scientists. We have more than 1,300 members over 60 countries across the Palearctic region. And our focus is not limited to dry grasslands, but all types of natural and semi-natural grasslands. We organize conferences, field workshops, special features, and we publish the journal Palearctic Grasslands. Uh, our membership is free of charge and has no obligation. So if you are willing, please feel free to become a member. We are broadcasting these online talks to give all of us an opportunity to be engaged in latest grassland research and conservation studies. This idea came after we canceled 2020 conference due to Corona, and we decided to make use of online tools to make virtual meetings. So this winter we will have three talks. So the first one will be today, we will have Nadia Simons to talk about insect decline in grasslands. And in January, Milan Kitsri will be with us to talk about Venus habitat classification. And in February, Hannah Prentice will talk about ancient and modern grasslands. So I am very excited about today's first talk. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. And I would like to quickly explain the format. So the talk will last in about 40 minutes and all participants will be muted and their cameras will be off. Then there will be a short question and answer session. You can send your questions anytime using the chat option in the menu button. Then we will pick a couple of questions to ask our spe speaker at the end. Please remember that we are also recording this video and we will post the video to EDGG's YouTube channel. So let me introduce our first speaker, Nadia Simons. She will be talking about insect decline in grasslands of Germany. Nadia is a young researcher working on the interactions between land use, biodiversity and ecosystem functioning. Her special focus is on arthropods. She has several high impact papers on this subject, including the famous insect decline paper, which appeared in Nature in, at the end of 2019. She is leading or contributing to several projects related to insect diversity in grasslands, forests, urban areas, and deadwood systems. She is now a postdoctoral researcher in the uh, Ecological Networks Lab of the Technical University of Darmstadt. So I thank to Nadia for accepting our invitation to give this very first talk. And I would like to hand Zoom over to her. So I'm starting my talk um, by talking about a crisis but not uh, COVID-19 because this is a crisis that we're all very familiar with by now, but the global biodiversity crisis. And this crisis is manifesting itself by the fact that about 10% of fish species, 10% of bird species, 30% of mammals and 40% of amphibians are considered threatened with extinction. And it is estimated that up to 30% of all plant and animal species are likely to be lost from our planet in our lifetime. This uh, loss of biodiversity has also been called the sixth mass extinction event and is almost exclusively due to humanity's impact on the biosphere. While scientists have long documented this crisis, it was, among others, last year's report of the IPBES conference that brought this crisis to a wide attention of media and the politics. In my talk and also in 
um, this series, we're going to focus on the grasslands. And grasslands are one of the systems that are threatened by this biodiversity crisis. And grasslands are very important because they have a very high richness of plant species per square meter. And this high plant species richness is even comparable to some of the tropical forests um, on Earth. Those grasslands are also very precious because even though they cover about 25% of Europe's land surface, only 8% of them are still in a natural, a semi-natural state. The others are um, under a certain type of management. So in this talk, I will focus on insects in grasslands. First, I will present some of the evidence of insect decline. Then I will talk about the effect of grassland management on insects, take a closer look at the direct and indirect mechanisms of biodiversity change, and finally discuss some possible solutions for insect conservation in grasslands. So there's a long tradition of insect observation and monitoring in Europe, and especially in Great Britain. Therefore, the signs of population declines were first evident for insect groups that are attractive and easy to observe, such as butterflies. Already in 2004, Jeremy Thomas and his colleagues reported that the majority of butterfly species in Great Britain has decreased in population size between 1970 and 1999. In a Eurobyte survey, this decline in butterfly species was also confirmed. And it was also shown that butterfly populations declined even more since 2019, with an average population of butterflies in grasslands declining by up to 60% in size. In 2017 then, Kaspar Hallmann and his colleagues showed that the loss of insects is not restricted to attractive species such as butterflies, but that it affects the whole insect community. They analyzed data from malaise traps that you can see here in the picture. And these malaise traps collect flying insects. And the researchers, and especially a lot of citizen scientists, had placed these malaise traps in different nature conservation sites across Germany. And they have been sampling flying insects with these traps since 1990. And over the sampling period of 27 years, they could show that the biomass of insects had declined by almost 75%. This dramatic decline of insect biomass caught the attention of the mass media, especially in Germany, but also worldwide leading to calls for saving insects across society and um, politics. So while the need for action was clear, not only to scientists, but also conservationists and other groups, it was first um, still controversial whether insect declines were maybe restricted to particular habitats or particular insect groups. But two, year two years later, in 2019, colleagues from Munich and myself could confirm this dramatic decline in insects. And we could also show that it is not restricted to grasslands. So in the next few minutes, I want to introduce this particular study and present you some of our key findings. The study was conducted as part of the Biodiversity Exploratories. This is a long-term research platform funded by the DFG, the German Research Foundation, and it's running since 2006 and still ongoing. Within this platform, over 300 scientists from seven countries investigate how biodiversity and ecosystem functions are affected by management. The research itself is conducted within three regions of Germany, that you can see here. And within each of these regions, 50 grassland and 50 forest plots are monitored. The plots are located within large management units and the management is only determined by the landowners, so not influenced by the scientists. Each plot is equipped with a small weather station that records the environment conditions um, continuously. And we also have information about the landscape surrounding of the plots. 
The 50 forest and 50 grassland plots cover the typical range of management type and intensity within each of the three regions. In grasslands, this gradient ranges from extensive pastures that are grazed once in a year by sheep or goat over unfertilized meadows, permanent pastures to fertilized meadows, which are mown up to three or four times per year. On these grasslands, insects are sampled by sweep netting over a standardized distance, both in early and mid-summer. And it has been um, done since 2008 and is still ongoing. In this study, we included data from 2008 to 2017. With this sweep netting, we assess the arthropod community of the vegetation um, layer. All the samples that are collected are first sorted into taxonomic groups, um, rough orders by student helpers, and then a select group of um, taxa are sent to taxonomic experts for species determination. Over the nine years included in the study, we sampled more than 860,000 individuals. Um, of those, almost 180,000 were determined to species level, which in total were 1,309 different arthropod species. So based on these um, selected taxonomic groups, we could show that not only biomass of the insects, shown here, but also the number of species at a regional level and the number of species on the plot level declined significantly between 2008 and 2017. We could also show that this decline was not only restricted to grasslands, but also very pronounced in forests. A first look at the decline in individual species indicates that the overall decline is not driven by a few single species, but that all arthropod species are affected. Even species which are generally common and can occur in high abundances, such as these different true bugs or vivos. So there seems to be something general going on in the community that is affecting the species, irrespective of their um, tax taxonomic um, grouping or um, functional diversity. When we took a closer look at the interaction between the plot characteristics, where we sampled the insect, and the trend over time, we discovered that the decline in species number was strongest on grasslands, which had a high cover of arable field around them. So here you can see the trend over time for different sets of grassland plots, and they are sorted by cover of arable fields. So we have plots with low cover of arable fields and plots with high cover, and those with a high cover of arable fields in the surrounding show a much more pronounced decline over time in species number. So this result indicates that the drivers behind the insect decline are acting on the landscape scale rather than on the level of individual grasslands. This conclusion is also confirmed when we look at the change in species number across the gradient of land use intensity. So here on the x-axis we now have land use intensity and then species number again. So we see a clear negative effect of management intensity on species numbers, but this relationship is stable over time. And also the relative change over time, so from 2008 to 2017, is very similar across the gradient of land use intensity. The only difference is that grasslands under extensive management already started with a higher number of species at the beginning of the study and have now more species left at the end of the study period. So we have seen that insect decline is indeed a general phenomenon affecting insect communities across habitats and taxonomic guilds. We've also seen indications that management negatively affects insect communities. And in the next part of my talk, I will take a closer look at these different aspects of 
um, communities and how they are affected by management. When we look at the abundance of individual species along the gradient of land use intensity and determine at which point of the land use intensity gradient a species becomes rare, indicated as a gray point here, or does not occur at all, indicated by this black area, we see that about 50% of all arthropod species are not occurring at all at higher than intermediate land use intensity. So when we reach intermediate and land use intensity, 50% of the species will not occur at any of the grasslands plot with a higher intensity. And we also see that about 75% of all the species are generally rare, so they are found with fewer than three individuals on each of the grassland plots. So something's going on already at intermediate land use intensities, and we have communities that consist mostly of rare species. So this is um, a different visualization of a typical arthropod community under extensive land use, so on a semi-natural and natural grassland. Such a community consists of many rare species. So each point in that graph is one species and the species are sorted following their abundance with the most abundant species um, leading the row and then other species following by their, um, according to their abundance. So we have a long tail of species with very low abundances, then a large portion of intermediate, intermediately abundant species and few species which are dominating the commun community. What's also very typical is that the most abundant species has a very moderate dominance. So it's very close to the second most abundant species. So it's a very um, shallow curve with a high number of species. We can now compare this um, with a community from an intensively used grassland. So here you see the intensively, the community from the intensively used grassland and the other community still in the background. So the first difference is we have a much lower number of overall species and the most abundant species has a much stronger dominance in the community. So in fact, 85% of all individuals in this community belong to this one dominant species. When we looked at these different abundance um, structures and an abundance curves across along the gradient of land use intensity, we found that dominance of the most common species consistently increased with land use intensity, especially with fertilization and communities under intensive land use also had a much lower number of rare species. The, those changes in the abundance structure of the community have strong consequences for the stability of the community and the whole ecosystem. The reason behind this is that the negative effect of, um, negative effect on stability is that um, species behave and react differently to fluctuations in an environment. So in a system with more species, the decline in abundance of one species, for example, this purple one here, can be compensated by an increase in another species. And for example, this um, green species here. So communities with few species where the abundance of the whole community is driven by a single species, the dominant species, this effect of compensation between species is less strong. And this is also due because the species are less synchronous in their abundances. So when we looked at the stability in overall abundance of the herbivore community and the predator community in our systems, we found that community stability is increased by a high diversity, but also by a high asynchrony among the species. So the more different the species reacted over time, the more stable the community as a whole became. And this was true for both the herbivore community and the predator community. 
overall abundance, generally decreased stability because the communities were more dominated by one individual dominant species. Overall, land use intensity negatively affected both asynchrony and diversity. So in, to in total, so overall, land use intensity decreased stability for both herbivores and predators. This means that land use intensity likely acts as a filter for species, which reacts similarly to changes in environmental conditions. So by filtering the community towards species that are more synchronous, reacting more synchronously over time, the overall stability of the community strongly decreases. We also found that land use intensity not only filters for species which react similarly to the environment, but also for certain morphological and functional traits in the arthropod community. We collected both morphological measurements of true bugs and literature data on functional traits for all the different species that we looked at, that we sampled. So when we now look at the abundance weighted mean of, tr of traits within a community, we can look at shifts in um, traits that are um, driven by land use intensity changes. So for example, in true bug communities, we found that the average body shape of the community is more long and thin rather than thick and short under more intensive land use. This means that communities under intensive land use are more dominated by species that have a very pronounced long and thin body shape, such as this one. On the other hand, communities under extensive land use intensity have a more balanced composition of body shapes. So they have an equal share of species that are more round and thick, like this one. One possible mechanism behind this shift could be that long and thin species are better adapted to high grasses, which dominate under intensive management. A second change in functional traits that we found in a community was that the average dispersal ability of the arthropod community changed with land use intensity. So while dispersal ability was generally rather high in our communities, it even increased under intensive management with communities consisting almost exclusively of species with very high dispersal ability under highest management intensity. One possible mechanism behind this change is related to the increase in disturbance frequency with increasing management. So more, the more frequently a habitat is disturbed, for example, by mowing or grazing or fertilization, the less likely it is for a species to be able to avoid this disturbance or recolonize the habitat after the disturbance. And this is especially true for species with a low dispersal ability. So we've seen that grassland management not only affects the diversity of insects, so the number of species, but also the community structure, leading to, more, to communities being dominated by individual species. And it also affects the functional composition of the community. I've also already hinted at some of the potential mechanisms behind those effects. And in the next part of the talk, I will look at those mechanisms a bit more closely and try to separate between direct and indirect direct effects of management. So when we talk about management of grasslands, we usually talk about three components, grazing, mowing, and fertilization. Many studies found that grazing in generally is beneficial for insects and grasslands because grazers create a heterogeneous, heterogeneous vegetation structure um, through leaving grazed and ungrazed patches. But in contrast, mowing affects the whole grassland at once by removing the vegetation layer and with it the resources for the herbivorous insects. In addition, the process of mowing itself is lethal to insects. 
Jean-Yves Hubert from uh, Switzerland could show in many different experiments that the mortality of caterpillars and also of grasshoppers is as high as 80% depending on the type of mower used and the following processing steps. So while many insect species have adapted to traditional haymaking processes in grasslands and can compensate for the loss of um, resources, the tempor temporal loss of resources, or they can recolonize grasslands after mowing, many other insect species can't tolerate the high mowing frequency of intensively used meadows. So this is a very strong direct effect of grassland management on insects. In addition, a high frequency of mowing and also high levels of fertilization strongly change the plant community composition towards fast growing grass species. Many herbaceous plant species can't compete with the grass species and are lost from intensively used grasslands. This shift in the plant community, this loss of plant um, diversity, results in an additional indirect effect of management. So one possible way this indirect effect can happen is that when you have fewer plant species, a lower species richness of plants, there are less niches for herbivorous um, species to feed on. And if you have a lower diversity of um, herbivores, there might also be fewer niches for specialized predators in the community. A second possible way in which this indirect effect um, can drive insect diversity is through changes in the resource availability. So if fewer resources are available, fewer individuals of consumers can be sustained by those resources. And especially rare species are less likely to achieve sustainable population sizes. So either through the diversity or the abundance of resources, a change in plant community could shape herbivore and predator communities. We looked at those both mechanisms for the plant herbivore and predator communities on our grasslands. Using structural equation models, we were able to disentangle the two alternative, alternative pathways of indirect management. So what we see here in this um, summary figure is that land use intensity measured as grazing, mowing, and fertilization, strongly increased plant biomass on the grassland, which is logical because farmers manage their grasslands to increase plant biomass and um, produce um, fodder for their animals. At the same time, land use intensity decreased plant species richness. And while the increase in plant biomass did not affect the biomass of herbivores, the decrease in plant species richness led to a decrease in herbivore richness because the more plant species available, the higher the richness of herbivores. On the other hand, predatory richness was not as strongly determined by herbivore richness, but much more strongly by predator biomass and herbivore biomass. So for higher trophic levels, it seems that resource availability and abundance is much more important than um, resource diversity. So although herbivores are the dominant feed group um, among the vegetation dwelling arthropods in our data set, so predators are not as frequently sampled as the herbivores, their um, relative abundance of herbivores even decreased with land use intensity. So we saw that land use intensity decreased plant diversity and also decreased herbivore diversity and relative abundance. This loss in herbivore abundance is not equally strong across all herbivore species. So a specialist herbivores are much more strongly affected than generalist herbivores. So specialists show a clear um, decline in abundance with land use intensity. So herbivore species which have a close link to some or few um, plant species are more strongly threatened 
by management, likely because those plant species get lost from the community. So even though most food webs are resistant to losses of specialized species because they have general fewer linkages in the food web, some studies also found that especially in grasslands, the loss of specialist consumers can have dramatic cascading effects on the whole food web if they are themselves host to specialized predators or parasitoids. The consequences of insect decline for other trophic levels have in fact been already visible. So Diana Bowler and her colleagues, for example, showed that the abundance of insectivorous birds in Europe has declined strongly um, in the last 25 years, while the population sizes of other bird species that are more omnivores or feed on seeds have remained stable in the same time frame. So we're already seeing the consequences of insect decline in our grasslands. So we've seen that direct effects of management can be very devastating for insects, but that management also indirectly affects other food communities by changes in the plant community composition. For the last 10 minutes of my talk, I will now look at some possible solutions for biodiversity friendly management. And with this, um, I will focus on the landscape scale. I focus on the landscape scale because we found that landscape composition um, not only affects the decline of insects, but we also found that landscape composition and configuration can compensate for the effect of infield management. So when we looked at the community composition of the arthropods in our grasslands, for um, and comparing different grasslands of different management intensity and with different surroundings, we found that large generalists are associated with high intensity in the fields themselves, so in the grasslands themselves, while Smaller generalists, shown here, are associated with high configurational heterogeneity. So the more um, diverse in size and shape the landscape is, the more beneficial this is for small generalists. And feeding specialists, the more most specialized community um, species in our systems are positively associated with high compositional heterogeneity in the landscape. So the number and diversity of different habitat types. So if we have landscapes that have a high compositional and high configurational heterogeneity, we can support um, species that are usually um, negatively affected by a management intensity. The role of landscape heterogeneity for biodiversity has also been shown by many other studies. And one of these um, studies that I like very much is a study by Peter Bartoli and colleagues. And they, they found that species richness of ground beetles and spiders increased with the amount or the length of field borders in a landscape, indicating that patches, um, small patches of different land use within a landscape, as it's typically, typically still found in Western Germany, is beneficial for biodiversity or does promote biodiversity better than landscapes with large patches of homogeneous land use. And this edge effect was even stronger than the positive effect of organic versus conventional farming, both in the West and Eastern of Germany. This comparison um, directly leads me to one of the problems that we, that we need to tackle when we're talking about conservation in managed um, landscapes and managed grasslands. And it's the problem that if we reduce management intensity for conservation, we inevitably also decrease production. And this can threaten farmers' income or lead to farmers having to import fodder from overseas. So usually, or traditionally, this conflict between having to produce or wanting to produce um, 
on a landscape, but also conserving biodiversity has been investigated and looked at under the paradigm of land sharing versus land sparing. So land sharing usually means that the whole landscape that's considered is used for production, but it's done so very extensively. So conservation is happening on the same habitats as production. Whereas land sparing means that we're using only a small proportion of the landscape for high intensity farming and can then leave the rest of the landscape as a reserve for biodiversity conservation. We can, then, we can now adapt this paradigm, this approach, for our grassland systems. What we need to do is, we just have to define what is conservation management or conservation in managed grasslands. And in fact, very extensively managed grasslands that are only grazed once a year by sheep are actually the, the method or management of choice for conservation. So also in grasslands, we can compare grasslands that are extensively farmed and managed with high intensive um, farming, farm grasslands and conservation farming. So for any given landscape and any given productivity in that landscape, we can then look at the different possible combinations of production and conservation by changing the proportion of the grasslands being used for conservation. So on the left, here we have a high proportion of the landscape under conservation and only a small part under very intensive management. And then we can decrease theoretically the proportion of the landscape under conservation. And with each step that we decrease the area, we can also decrease the intensity that we have to manage on the remaining grasslands in order to achieve a certain set of production on the whole landscape. Having sampled the arthropods in our grasslands along a gradient of land use intensity and therefore along a gradient of yield or productivity, we can model each species response to management intensity or yield and then predict the species abundance at any given productivity level. So in this example, you see four um, typical species that we find in our grasslands and the four typical shapes of response curves, curves that we see in our community. So when we have these abundance um, productivity curves for each species, we can then calculate the overall population size of each of the species in any given landscape by multiplying its abundance on the different, um, at a given productivity level and by the um, amount of um, grasslands that are managed at this um, particular level of intensity. And we do that for both the area that is under conservation and for the area that's under management. When you calculate this overall population size for all the different combinations of landscape configurations, we can also look at the optimal configuration for each of the species. So in this species, um, a very low proportion under kind of conservation would be the optimal um, situation because it reaches its highest overall population size. Whereas for the other species, a high proportion of men, uh, grasslands under conservation would yield the best um, outcome. And we can also look at different thresholds of population size. So ask, does a species at, under a certain landscape configuration at least reach, let's say 20 or 25% of the population size that it would reach under an optimal scenario? Okay, so on the next um, slides, I want to present you some of the results of this approach. Um, and this result is um, calculated for the Heinrich Dune region, which is the central of the three exploratory regions. Okay, so on the slide, you can see in the middle, a representation of all the grasslands in the Heinrich region. And each 
grassland is shown with its um, proximate size and with its land use intensity. Yellow means a very um, low intensity, green are intermediate intensities, and blue are the very high intensively managed grasslands. So under the current um, situation that is depicted here, we have 13 arthropod species that reach 90% of the population size that they would under optimal landscape configuration, and 120 species, so almost all the species we sampled, reach at least 25% of their optimal population size. And then here in these two graphs, you can always see the number of species that reach a certain uh, threshold, 90% or 25%, under the optimal landscape configuration. And on the x-axis, you can also de see different um, target production. So this is the production of the whole landscape. And this asterisk and the line represent the current situation. So this is our baseline. We don't, we don't want to go uh, worse than this. Okay, so let's look at the modeling results. Let's look at the optimal solution at each of the different um, options. So if we want to increase conservation, under unchanged production. So we want to produce the same amount of plant biomass as we're currently doing, but we want to have more species reach the 90% or 25% population target. Can we do that? And yes, we can in fact do this. So if we look at how many species reach 90% of their optimal population size, we see that we can, that there is a, a solution of landscape configuration that increases this number. At the same time, the optimal solution for at least 25% population size is not very different from the current situation. We can even improve conservation and production. So if we go further to the right here and increase landscape level production, we still find optimal solutions that promote more would that have more species reach 90% of the optimal population size than in the current situation. And even a little bit more species that um, reach at least 25% of the population size. 25% of the population size. What's also interesting is that these landscapes differ a lot. So if we want to have more, a lot of species with very high population sizes, we need a different landscape configuration that's very similar to land sharing. But if we want to have all species uh, in the landscape reach at least 25% of population size, we need a landscape configuration that's more similar to a land sparing approach. The optimal solution for Biodiversity in each case looks very similar. So if we have, want to promote a selected number of species with almost optimal population sizes, we have to go for land sharing. But if we want to have at least a minimum population size for all the species, we would have to go for a more land sparing approach. And which approach we actually choose in the end will have to strongly depend on the identity of the species that we want to conserve and also the possibilities that the um, abiotic conditions in the grasslands actually provide. So if it's even possible to um, realize these management scenarios. So summarizing my talk, we wanted to understand more about how we can protect grassland biodiversity and especially insects we can look at four different scales. So what we need to do is at the species level, so at the level of individual arthropod species, we need to understand which traits make those species more vulnerable to management and insect and other drivers of decline. At the level of communities, we need to make sure that we can promote diverse communities at all trophic levels, because that will support diversity at closely connected trophic levels. If we look at the scale of different management, different grasslands that are managed differently, we need to make sure that we increase 
the spatial and temporal heterogeneity in management. So if you can make sure that mowing, for example, doesn't happen at all grasslands at the same time, we have a higher chance of providing refugee habitats for um, vulnerable insects. And we also need to include a landscape perspective in planning and need to think about if we can make, find solutions that include a whole landscape rather than individual grasslands. And with this, I'm at the end of my talk. I want to thank again the organizers of this online series for the opportunity to pre present my research here. I want to thank all the different um, student helpers and all the other researchers um, that have been working hard in the biodiversity explorers since years to make this research and results possible. Um, I want to thank the DFG for funding and you for your attention and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Uh, dear Nadia, we thank you for this excellent talk. So you provided us a very comprehensive view about uh, grassland insects and the effect of land use and density on plot level and landscape level and uh, you finished the talk with a very positive and promising message that there are solutions. So uh, now it's time to ask questions uh, in, in the chat, but so far there are no questions. So let's give you a few minutes for <laughs> rest and then perhaps we may get some questions. Ivona, can you uh, facilitate the question and answer session? Uh, yes, hello. Um, uh, first, uh, I would like also uh, thanks to, to Nadia for this wonderful talk and very nice presentation. Uh, one question appeared uh, in the chat. Uh, this is the question from uh, Jean-Yves Humbert. Uh, so I'm um, start read this uh, question. Thank you, Nadia, for the talk and new insights you brought in the topic in Seaport et al. Uh, 2019. Uh, we can see a strong decline between the first and second year, 2008 and 2009. How are the trends without 2008, especially for grasslands insect biomass, still significant? If yes, how much decline? Yes. Um... So you're right, you're correct, uh, that the most, the strongest decline occurred between 2008 and 2009. And we uh, looked at the, the trends removing 2008 and the trends are still significant. I don't know the exact number from the top of my head, but I'm pretty confident that it was still above 50% of decline overall. I would have to look that up, but it was still, um, it was not that as dramatic, but it was still very clear and significant. And we're not sure why this happens. We're not sure what uh, made 2008 exceptional. We looked at all different possible um, explanations, but nothing clearly obvious um, is in the data. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So, um, other questions? Okay, um, next question. Uh, Jürgen Denker is uh, asking, um, uh, thank you so much for this exciting talk. Do you have any possible explanation for the unexpected finding that increased plant biomass doesn't translate into increased herbivore biomass in your um, SAMs? Mm -hmm. The one possible explanation would be that the grassland communities that have a very high biomass are dominated by very few um, species, especially grass species. So we assume that there's just um, a certain population size of, of insects or herbivore species that can use these grass species or utilize the grass species and that they are not 
like exponentially increasing with um, plant biomass. They're not mapping the plant biomass increase that much. And that by having a more diverse community of plant species that are not as productive of overall, we do have more niches for herbivores that can then um, use the resources by, by these different plant species. And especially grass species are also not very palatable for many herbivore insects. So the, the increase in plant biomass does not directly translate into herbivore biomass. Okay, thank you. And, um, okay, uh, but uh, you can ask again. Uh, so, is, is it that the insects have not evolved in a high biomass world? <laughs> yeah, probably they have not evolved in a high biomass world. That's true. Yeah, I guess. Um, I'm thinking about a different way of, of framing that, but, but that's true. I mean, grasses are also especially good at avoiding um, herbivores because of the silicate they have in their leaves. So there's always this um, competition between plants trying to evolve or having to evolve evolve in an environment with lots of herbivores and apparently they're a bit better at protecting themselves than the herbivores are at using all the resources that are, that are available. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, next question came from a Karen Powder. Uh, biomass yield is not necessarily the main objective of intensive grassland management. High contents of energy and digestibility are as important. This motivates early cutting and high cutting frequencies more than biomass yield. How would your optimum change with other target functions? Yeah. yeah. I don't know, honestly, because we haven't looked at that yet. So we have, until now, we have only looked at the overall biomass production. And we have also um, combined sort of the different ways in which this biomass is produced. So because we have grazed and mown sites, we had to find a way to um, use the same measure of biomass production for both of these sites. So for the Mown sites, we actually use the, the amount of biomass that that's, um, has been growing before it's um, cut. And for the grazed ones, we actually derived plant biomass production through the number of um, cattle that's on the grassland, assuming that farmers will have the maximum number of cattle um, on, a, on a grassland that can be sustained by the grassland. So in terms of it's, it's a bit of an indirect measure, but it would be very interesting to also include um, quality of the plant biomass in, in that model. And it would be possible, so because the data is available, we just haven't had the time to look at that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, more questions? May I directly ask uh, without struggling in writing on chat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. So my, my question is, uh, so you nicely showed us uh, playing with the landscape configuration. It's possible to have a win-win scenario, both in terms of production and insect conservation. Is there a mechanism in Germany that you can design landscape at the scale that you are working. Is it something uh, easy and straightforward to implement? Mm, no, unfortunately, I would say no. I'm not aware of any um, schemes that, that really explicitly take that into account. So kind of making so what you would do, need to do is kind of 
um, distribute the production that you have in a landscape among all the grassland owners, right? So that um, the grassland owners that manage extensively and don't produce as much on their individual grasslands um, still uh, benefit from it. I mean, in a way, it's a bit like um, socialism uh, was supposed to work or it worked that everyone is managing um, for everybody and then you distribute it equally. But currently that's not something um, that would work. What could potentially work is if you don't look at it from a, at a whole landscape, so not including a whole um, number of different um, farmers and landowners, but maybe look at the different grasslands of one individual um, farmer or landowner. And then I think it would be very, or much easier to implement such a scheme if um, the farmer would um, develop kind of a model or plan on how to manage the different grasslands that they um, do manage and then um, show that the overall system of its grasslands promotes biodiversity. If we could have a system that would support this, that would be very beneficial, I think. Yeah, it would be great. Thank you. Okay, are there any um, questions more? So it seems that we don't have any more questions, right? No, nothing appeared. Okay, then I again uh, thank you to Nadia for giving this excellent first talk. And uh, before ending this session, uh, I would like to remind all of the participants that uh, in, in the next talk in January, Milan Kitri will be with us to talk about UNIS habitat classification system. And uh, we will upload this video on YouTube uh, today or tomorrow. So thanks for all of you uh, for joining us. And I wish you a very nice afternoon. <laughs>